Hey, thanks for pressing play on this episode of the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. A nostalgic look back at my favorite Rangers from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I'm your host, Tom Browning. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in to the 12th episode of the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. I'm your host, Tom Browning. It's with great pleasure that I bring along a dear friend of mine to join me on today's podcast. And hopefully uh, this young man will be my podcast uh, partner of the future if he enjoys what, what comes out of today's podcast. But I'd love to introduce uh, my dear friend, fellow uh, hockey aficionado, uh, Rob Berger, to the broadcast. Uh, Rob and I go back uh, many, many years And we've always enjoyed talking hockey during our professional meetings. And we talked recently about having Rob join us for this particular podcast. And before I introduce Rob to tell you a little bit about uh, himself, today's podcast is going to focus on uh, the great number 77, Phil Esposito. Now, people are going to wonder why in God's name do we put Phil Esposito into the category of forgotten New York Rangers greats. But in reality, he really is. I mean... Phil Esposito more for his uh, playing days with the uh, the Boston Bruins, the hated Boston Bruins, uh, than his playing time with the New York Rangers, despite the fact that uh, he led the Rangers to a Stanley Cup final in 1979. He has been the coach, GM, and TV analyst for the New York Rangers. So he touched so many facets of the New York Rangers organization the years that he was with uh, the Rangers. But to this day, you know, he's not really celebrated as a New York Ranger. So we're going to talk about the great number 77, Phil Esposito. Uh, but before we get to, to Trader Phil, we're going to, I'm going to introduce Rob. And Rob, if you could just uh, tell us something about uh, yourself, the audience get to know you a little bit better. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for calling me young. Uh, <laughs> and you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think in terms of a lot of the things we're talking about, I, I guess you could call me young. Uh, I'm a hockey enthusiast, obviously, especially when it comes to hockey history and advancing the game and the analysis of the game. Uh, I'm a New Yorker for about 13 years now, full disclosure. I'm not a native New Yorker. Uh, I'm from Los Angeles. I'm a born and raised Kings fan, which used to give me a lot of grief in New York for them being bad. Not so much anymore after 2014. (laughs) Um, I don't know if that's going to come up again, but I'm really looking forward to this podcast and talking about Phil Esposito. Great. What is it about the forgotten hockey players? Uh, and it doesn't have to be with the New York Rangers, but what is it about uh, the forgotten hockey player podcast, the whole genre or well, the whole idea behind it that uh, attracted you to this particular topic? You know, we, we're going through, we have a, an area, an era of hockey that, that isn't, as t- isn't talked about as much anymore. And a lot of that has to do with the advent of the internet and social media where we know so much over the last 20 years or so of hockey we have this era of the 70s and 80s that mm-hmm. fell fell behind a little bit. Uh, it's not considered as much of a historical area as the pre-expansion in 67. Um, and if you talk to people, especially here locally in New York, we have Rangers that aren't as remembered as as fondly um, as your Gilberts and Rattels that need to be talked about. There were some good to great Ranger teams and some great players that that should be remembered and discussed frequently. Totally agree. I think, it, and to my way of thinking, you may not agree, and maybe uh, you know my son is very similar in age to you. And um, I think the late '60s, all of the '70s, and probably up to the mid '80s, I thought it was the most exciting, charismatic, flamboyant time in National Hockey League history. Uh, some of the characters that played back then, the personalities, the idiosyncrasies, uh, the style of play, the fans. To me, it was just. It was electric. It really, really was. Um, but yeah, you know, we can. Always, that's something for another, another show. We can get to that a little bit, you know, in future uh, podcast. But uh, I agree. I think it's the forgotten history. Yeah. So I, I want to thank you. Do, is there any um, feeling for the forgotten players of the Los Angeles Kings? Are there real quick? Are there players that maybe really were important players for the Kings before your time? That. You know, just your knowledge of L.A., L.A. sports, L.A. hockey, that maybe, you know, would be very pertinent in a discussion like we're having today when it comes to uh, the 60s and 70s and early 80s. Well, I, you know, I think I think a big name would be uh, would be Barry Beck. Um, you know, a lot of the guys, not necessarily, I don't think, tied in with the Rangers per se. A lot, a lot of kings from the 60s and 70s and early 80s that ended up being very successful elsewhere, you know, whether it be – guys like Larry Murphy or, or Butch Goring yep. um, that won cups and won awards on other teams. 
Um, I don't know so much with the Rangers, though. I, that, that's a great area to explore. There are a lot of kings that are forgotten. I mean, to show you how, you know, how forgotten old kings are, just how long it took for Rogi Vishon to get into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. I think it's a West Coast mentality. You know, I guess well, when you played out in the West Coast, especially back maybe in the 70s or 80s, uh, there wasn't as great of an appreciation of the talent out there. You know, I think of Mike Murphy. You know, I, he just happened to be a former Ranger, but he was a very important player for the Kings at one time, you know. And, of course, Jay Wells came to the Rangers, won a cup with them, but he was an important figure, I thought, for uh, because I, w- I lived in L.A. for several years in the 80s, and I went to the Kings games. And, uh, you know, Charlie Simmer, I'm not sure if Charlie Simmer is, is really thought of very highly today or if he's involved in a lot of the King's activities today. Uh, I think Marcel Dion obviously has, so I don't think he's. You can categorize him as forgotten player, but maybe a, a Fox or or a Charlie Simmer. I don't know. Uh, maybe I maybe I stand corrected. Uh, Bernie Nichols. I don't know if those guys are are still active within the uh, the Kings community. Well, I was actually going to bring up Bernie Nichols. You know, a great. We could have a whole show on on the Bernie Nichols trade uh, for Sandstrom and Granado. Um, yeah, you know, Bernie Nichols is still active with the Kings. Charlie Simmer, not so much, although. You know, two thirds of the Triple Crown line have their numbers retired in L.A., so he he moved away from L.A. for for a long time, so he's not as active. But every I think he's definitely someone that's remembered. He used to do uh, TV for the Coyotes, so he was in town a lot for that. And you know, used to you used to always find him before the game, walking around the forum, talking to fans, pre Staples Center era. But yeah, the Bray Nichols is a is a great discussion and and a guy that was on a Hall of Fame trajectory. Uh, he scored over 70 goals in 1989 uh, before he was moved. Uh, rumors about a relation, you know, bad relationship uh, with Gretzky. And from a Rangers perspective, a, a pivotal trade for the Rangers right before they won the cup. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I wasn't a real fan of that trade at the time. I thought Bernie was a, a hell of a player for the Rangers. And, uh, you know, to me, I think, uh, you know, I, I still think that I'm not sure if I would have pulled off that trade. I mean, the Rangers moved a lot of great young talent. They did win a cup. Uh, I often wondered if they could, they could have won a cup without making some of those moves because they did give up a bevy of young players. But and uh, as far as Simmer goes, I, I guess he finished his career with the uh, Boston Bruins, right? Yep. So. So it's uh, interesting. Uh, it's funny that he is not part of the Hall of Fame. The third member of that line, just like Vic Hatfield, is not yet a member of the, not a Hall of Fame. Excuse me, having his number retired. But you know, Hatfield, by by no stretch of the, uh, the imagination, is a Hall of Famer. But he'll have his number retired next year. But uh, yeah, so it's interesting. But uh, Rob, I want to thank you for joining me today. It's uh, it's great to have you on board. And so let's get to Phil. You know, and I'll start off. You know, as a as a Ranger fan back in the. 60s and 70s, you know, Phil played with the hated Boston Bruins. You know, the Bruins were the New York Islanders before the New York Islanders. They were, they were the Rangers' uh, arch rivals, their nemesis. You know, it was uh, just, uh, it was just incredibly intense hockey between the Bruins and Rangers. Probably going back to the late 50s, early 60s, when the Rangers and Bruins were really the bottom of the of the uh, original six National Hockey League. They were the two worst teams in the league at that time, and trying to garner respectability. And it wasn't until, obviously, the Bruins signed Bobby Orr, traded for Phil Esposito, and the Rangers drafted Park and Rattel that the fortunes of both franchises started to change. But, you know, the the big bad Bruins, right, the burly Bruins with the likes of uh, Teddy Green and Bobby Orr and Wayne Cashman and Kenny Hodge, Jerry Cheevers and Eddie Westfall, Johnny McKenzie, a former Ranger, Derek Sanderson, who was a real thorn in, in the side of the New York Rangers. You know, it was... Those personalities, that tough physical style of play that uh, the Rangers had a tough time dealing with. And, you know, it was that physical style of play that enabled Phil Esposito after the trade from the Chicago Blackhawks with two big wingers in uh, Wayne Cashman and Ken Hodge that really gave the Rangers fits. And Brad Park would always lament that, um, you know, Phil Esposito in the slot, while he was always moving, and Pat Quinn said the same thing, Phil Esposito was not the most quick player in the league, but he was always moving. And it was tough to defend a guy like Phil Esposito in the slot because the fallacy is, or the um, the misconception was, he would plant his skates right in front of the goalie and just sit there. But that wasn't the case. He was always moving. And he found a spot that was a little bit too far out for the defenseman to pay too close attention and uh, not far enough toward the blue line for the forwards to really uh, be able to defend him adequately. And he had such a quick shot. You know, he would get the puck from Hodge and uh, Cashman, and he had such a quick release. He had that wrist shot that was very deceptive, but the release caused a lot of havoc. And playing the Bruins, it was very, very tough. They would just physically beat up on the smaller New York Rangers team. So... And then, of course, the Bruins beat the Rangers in the 1972 Stanley Cup Finals to add insult to injury 
at Madison Square Garden. And obviously that fueled the fire of the um, the two teams going against each other and the rivalry. And so when the Rangers made the trade back in 1975, um, it was a, a tale of two teams having a tough start. Harry Sinden and the Bruins were having a real difficult start with their season. Bobby Orr, his knees were shot. Harry Sinden knew that was really the end of Bobby Orr. As a matter of fact, Orr would only play 10 more games after that big trade between the Rangers and the Bruins. So he knew he had to make some changes, and he knew that Brad Park had a lot more in him. He knew, despite Park having bad knees, he knew that Jean Rattel, if he could only have two big wingers like Esposito did, he knew he could get a lot more out of Jean Rattel. That was insight that Emil Francis didn't have for, for whatever reason. And so um, little did I know, though, that those negotiations on that trade took more than a month to make. Emil Francis actually approached Hins- Harry Sinden first at a GM meeting, and uh he said, listen, Harry, you know, I think we should, both teams are struggling. I think we should consider making a move here. And I'm not talking about deuces and threes. I'm talking about some of the star players. And, and Harry asked them, you know, what do you have in mind? He said, well, how about uh, Park and Rattel for Esposito and Orr? And Sinden said, I can't trade Bob Hewer. I just can't trade him. So they decided to, you know, continue talking. And there was a dialogue. And about a month and a half later, teams were still struggling. I think they waited that month to see if you know, the fortunes of the team would turn around, but it never happened. And the Rangers pulled off the trade. The Bruins pulled off the trade. The Zanussi, Vertel, and Park for uh, Carol Vadney and Phil Esposito. So, you know, I'll get into what I thought, how the trade worked out for both teams. But what is your understanding of the trade, Rob? What, what was your, you know, looking at it, you know, with today's lens, what would have been your reaction to a trade like that if that happened today? Or what was your, what are your feelings on this particular move? Yeah, a trade like that happening today, I would think would really shake things up, especially because it was so out of nowhere in terms of the players moving and how it happened. You know, both teams were on the West Coast when it happened, um, which which even today uh, would be big news because it, ha- it got released in the middle of the night. And we don't see a lot of that happening anymore. Yeah, uh, we, we don't see players like Esposito, Park and and Rattel going in a trade um, for each, each other anymore. You know, you I mean, I guess you can look back at a couple of trades, maybe you know Taylor Hall moving but we see we more see big names moved at the trade deadline right uh, you know right you know with no with no time left on their contract opposed to a trade in November uh, in the middle of the night and, you know the Rangers you know maybe you can speak better to this than I can I don't know if Emil Francis was worried about his job at the time but there were a slew of trades right before that uh, you know they traded Derek Sanderson right before that a Jockman right went right before that as well uh, Emil Francis was really blowing up the squad, um, and and by and by, uh, by the time the Esposito trade was done, there were only seven players that were on last year's team, the team from the year before, and that was in November. Um, obviously, this was a pre-salary cap era, so things were a little different, and you you had more freedom to make moves, and contracts were obviously a lot different, a lot less, but still, to make a move like that in the middle of the night without any press around. Um, trading big names that enjoyed being in the city that they were in. You know, Esposito uh, was very harsh when he was, you know, he was interviewed by the New York Times. He said, I thought I had a home in Boston. It's been a great town for me. Uh, you know, that it was crushed and, you know, and um, Park said a similar thing. You know, he was shocked. I had no inkling at all of such a trade. And from what I understand, neither did Esposito or Rattel. It really shook me up. I haven't quite recovered yet. Yeah, that's very true. As a matter of fact, um, Esposito, uh, now I'm sure he's being facetious, but he said he felt like jumping out of the balcony in his hotel room in Vancouver. And I guess uh, Brad Park found out about it at 7.30 the, the morning of the trade. You know, Ron Francis, uh, excuse me, Emo Francis, at the time was just the GM of the Rangers. Uh, Ron Stewart was the coach of the Rangers at that time. Uh, Sinden was coach and GM. No, I, I take that back. Sinden was the GM. Don Sherry was the coach because, yeah, Sherry and Esposito had uh, d- didn't get along, and I found that a little surprising. Uh, I guess Don Sherry was more of a lunch pail type of guy, and I kind of thought Phil Esposito was too, but Esposito didn't like, I guess, the coaching style of Sherry. So I was going to say, you know, today, usually when players are traded, there's, uh, you know, they're not happy, they're disgruntled, you know, there's, there's contract issues. But in the case of Esposito, all in all, he was happy being there. He was successful. Park and Rattel were very, were very comfortable, very happy. You know, there was no issues with contracts. Esposito was the highest paid hockey player. So you're right. Today, there's more involved, I guess. There's a lot more business facets that enter into a trade as opposed to uh, contracts. But Emil Francis said, you know, people forget, you know, it was tough being a coach and GM at, during those days because the WHA had just started and they really need to make sure that they had everything buttoned up and 
So he had to delegate the coaching duties to a, a Ron Stewart, and I guess Cinder did the same thing with Don Sherry. But you're right, the Rangers had uh, were bounced by the Islanders the year before. Very upsetting, obviously. It was a shock to the system, to the New York Rangers. Um, that necessitated, obviously, changes. And the year before, when the Rangers lost to the Flyers, one could argue that they started the house cleaning when they got rid of Hatfield. But I think with the Hatfield issue, that was more of a situation where, and I think t- to me, I'm getting off the subject a little bit, but, you know, I don't think for this reason Hatfield should have his number retired at the Garden, should not have, is when, you know, with a minute left to go against the Flyers and the Rangers call for too many men on the ice penalty, they're facing elimination and Hatfield is, you know, he's, he's got a big smile on his face in the penalty box. Now, you could argue you know, there were reasons for that, but, you know, when you see that on TV and your team is one minute away from being eliminated by the Philadelphia Flyers, the upstart Flyers, you know, there's going to be consequences and you're one of the leaders of the team. So one could argue that the, the rebuild started then, but it definitely started after the loss to the Islanders the spring before. And then, as Emil Francis said, we got off to a lousy start. I kept on waiting and waiting and waiting for the team to turn it around and send in the same thing. Hey, and then they made this blockbuster trade. And, you know, I'm just wondering if a Joe Thornton trade might be considered comparable. You know, you mentioned um, the other move, but I wonder if I can't think of anything recently, like he's like you mentioned. I can't think of anything as blockbuster as that, you know? The Joe Thornton trade happened for different reasons, though. I, you know, this trade really happened, you know, teams trying to shake things up. Yeah. Opposed to Thornton, which was a contract issue, um, a Bruins team that wasn't playing well and wanted to get value for Joe Thornton, who most likely wasn't going to come back the next season. Right. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. And when Wes, when Esposito joined the Rangers, uh, he didn't get off to a great start. He and Vadne did not get off to a great start, although... It ended respectively. The Rangers missed out on the playoffs. Esposito wound up scoring 29 goals for the Rangers. And uh, Vadne played okay, but the Bruins obviously enjoyed more of the return more quickly. Park resumed his uh, Hall of Fame career almost immediately with the Bruins. Uh, I think he found it very comfortable going to a stable organization like the Bruins. The Rangers, Bruins hadn't been making all that many big deals t- to the extent like the Rangers were doing. He liked Don Sherry. He liked playing with a bigger physical hockey team. It allowed him to get the time and space that he needed that he really wasn't afforded with the Rangers, and it definitely helped John Rattel, who, you know, early on in his career, Vic Hatfield was the Wayne Cashman, but as Hatfield became more successful as a goal scorer, more highly paid, Hatfield became less and less of a physical presence. And Roger Robert obviously was a snapper, a sniper on that goal of the game line, but he didn't have the protection. He wasn't uh, awarded the time and space that the Bruins gave Esposito with, with Hodge and, and Cashman and the physical players that the Bruins had. And John Rattel benefited tremendously. He was able to really, unencumbered, utilize that skill level that he had, that protection that he was afforded, and he scored, I believe it was eight goals in the playoffs, where he only had nine his entire career with the New York Rangers. So the Bruins really derived benefits more quickly than the Rangers did, uh, at least that first year. Oh, absolutely. You know, Park and Rattel both finished top 10 in, in Hart voting. Uh, Park finished second in, in Norris voting. Mm-hmm. Um, they didn't make it too far in the playoffs you know they, they lost to philly in the semis uh but yeah park and Rattel definitely got off to a much better start than esposito but you know but esposito did after that first season really bounced back and had some great years uh with with the rangers a good three years with the rangers yeah they missed the playoffs the first two years that uh, he and vadney played with that but you're right back in, in the 79 uh, playoffs obviously he scored over 40 goals that year and uh, led that young rangers team uh, to the Stanley Cup Finals. I believe he had eight goals. Correct me if I'm wrong, Rob. I think he had eight goals in the playoffs that particular playoff season with the New York Rangers. Uh, so he did very, very well in leading the team on the ice under, um, you know, Freddie Shiro, who was brought in, you know, to coach the Rangers. And it's a funny story about that. You know, I guess <laughs> I guess Esposito, a very flamboyant personality, I, I, I guess he didn't get along all the time with his coaches. You know, he didn't get along with Sinden, I guess. He didn't get along with Don Sherry. And uh, I don't know how... He got along with Ron Stewart, but with Freddie Shiro, I guess the the story is that uh, Shiro tried to bury Esposito uh, f- <laughs> uh, more than once. And I guess uh, the story was, this is how Esposito recalls it, is that uh, before every practice, Shiro would go out to him and say, you know, I can't believe you're still playing. You know, if you keep on playing until you get much older, you're going to be too old for the uh, old-timers game, you know. And he didn't like, Esposito didn't like that needling that uh, Fred Shear would always give him time and time again. And the story has it that uh, in trying to bury um, Esposito, he put Don Maloney, a rookie, and Donnie Murdoch, who was just back from suspension, on that line, thinking that Esposito, who only had three goals that particular season, the season they went to the Stanley Cup Finals, three goals uh, up until the All-Star game, thinking that this would be the end of Esposito. And 
un- unfortunately for Shiro, but fortunately for the Rangers, uh, they they all gelled. Uh, there was a tremendous uh, chemistry between those three players. And Esposito went on to score 42 goals that year. And the energy that those kids brought, he said it was very reminiscent of a young Ken Hodge and a young Wayne Cashman those days when he played for the Bruins, and uh, they went to the Stanley Cup uh, Finals. So, yeah, it took Esposito and Vadney a little bit longer to pay dividends for the Rangers, but uh, you're right, the Bruins enjoyed it right to almost the very end with uh, Rattel and uh, Park. Yeah, you know, yeah, Park definitely, you know, Park played through the 83 season in Boston, uh, was a Norris finalist almost every year, and won the Masterson Trophy with his next year in Detroit. So, you know, he played through 85, great career. And you you know you think about the Ranger teams in the early '80s, how much nicer it'd be to have Brad Park. Uh, don't you know? Not, nothing bad against Esposito, but to have a defenseman like Brad Park, wow. Yeah, you know, it, it just goes to show that the Rangers, Emil Francis, he had a blind spot. You know, he if he only had built his Rangers club similar to the Bruins and Flyers and Islanders, where you know he protected his skilled players with size. You know. You know, he didn't have a Gary Dornhofer or a Wayne Cashman or a Hodge or a Don Marcotte. You know, he didn't have any of those uh, big physical players. Uh, you know, Moose Dupont, he says, Emil Francis to this day says the biggest regret he had was trading Moose Dupont to uh, the St. Louis Blues uh, along with Mike Murphy for Jack Eagers. I mean, one of the, I mean, the Rangers have had a lot of bad trades. You know, you think of the Rick Middleton trade for Ken Hodge. But um, yeah, I mean, if the Rangers had, had given Park and Rattel and Gilbert more time and space, uh, even in 79, if the Rangers, besides Nick Fatiu, had some, uh, some, you know, some size uh, and grit. Uh, who knows? Maybe they could have. Maybe they could have caught the flat Montreal Canadiens and taken it all the way to uh, the Stanley Cup. You know, if, uh, but uh, you know it didn't work out. You know, and it's funny because you look at that '79 team and and you see along with Esposito two other 30 goal scorers. And, and today, you know that that that'd be spectacular to have three guys scoring 30 goals in 1979. Though you look at the roster, not the most impressive roster. No. Well, Shiro was a genius. You know, Shiro, they say, could... You know, it's funny, Freddie Shiro, they thought they built his teams around toughness, but it was actually the Flyers' front office that gave Shiro the tools to do what he did. Now, Shiro said... Shiro, Shiro was never a big believer in fighting, for what I understand, looking at his background, his biography. He just knew how to use the talent that he had to the team's uh, betterment. And um, so you could say that Shiro took what he had with the New York Rangers and really perfected it and molded it into the uh, Stanley Cup Finals club. Club that, uh, that that went to the finals that year, but uh, it was actually the Flyers front office Snyder. I forget who the owner was or who was the GM. Was Snyder, was Snyder the owner of the Flyers back then, or was he the GM? I'm trying to think. But uh, the Flyers were getting bullied around by the St. Louis Blues year in, year in and year out, and he decided that we're not going to take anymore. We're going to build a, a big, burly, strong hockey team. And you know, after the Boston Bruins, you know, they modeled their uh, their franchise after the Bruins, and the Islanders did the same thing too when uh, Bill Torrey came on as the GM. But uh, I often wondered if the Rangers never made that Middleton trade, one of the worst trades in NHL history. If they had gotten maybe a Ken Hodge earlier in his career, or if Vic Hatfield had remained the tough physical player that he was when early in his career with the Rangers if uh, they would have had more success. Yeah, it's interesting. Number 77, uh, went on to coach the Rangers, GM, TV analyst. Just funny how uh, he touched virtually every facet of uh, the Rangers organization. And, you know, he's really not, uh, you know, he's really not somebody that you think much about as it relates to the New York Rangers franchise, you know? And he's someone that's still very active in hockey. Yeah. Uh, he's taken quite the leadership role through the years with Tampa Bay, especially at their beginning. He still does TV with them. You can still you can still follow Phil Esposito on Twitter. He's very active promoting the team, uh, promoting that organization, and promoting the sport. Very colorful. Very very flamboyant. Very colorful. He said, you know, it wasn't for him. But you could argue that the Tampa Bay Lightning would not be. Uh, first of all, there might not be a Tampa Bay Lightning franchise. He really was uh, the guy responsible for bringing that franchise to the National Hockey League. Oh, a- absolutely, and and and. <laughs> What a job that that organization has done uh, over the past over the past uh, 15 years, if you will, winning the cup right before the dreaded 05 lockout, and that, and now building it back with Steve Eiserman to to heck of a franchise, and arguably one of the top three teams that's that's in contention for the cup this year. True. I'm wondering, can you think of a player today, Rob, before we uh, wrap up here, who a, a player or a handful of players that similar in personality, charisma, flamboyancy, you know that type of thing. To a Phil Esposito, I, you know, in today's game, it's tough for me to fit, to pinpoint anybody. Yeah, I mean, I, the the closest would have to be Ovechkin, I suppose. Um, that's vocal with the media and outspoken, um, lighthearted personality. 
you know, fresh off his 600th goal uh, of this week. Um, you know, yeah, I don't know. That's a reach. I don't know. I bet. I don't know. Maybe you're right. Maybe by today's standards, he would be the closest one. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I just I remember Phil Spazia though during that summit series with the Russians in '71, '72, that heartfelt pledge or the heartfelt request he made to the fans who were really down on the Canadian team. Right? They were Russians were doing a number on them, and they were they were being threatened to be blown right out of the series by the Soviets, and um, he. He was interviewed on the ice. You may have seen it on YouTube. He was interviewed on the ice, and he just pleaded with the uh, Canadian fans to, you know, take it easy on us, man. We're, we're playing the hardest that we can. You know, the, the, the Russian team is a group of players that have been playing with each other for a long time. We're being thrown together here during the summer to, you know, to represent our country, and it was a heartfelt plea that a lot of hockey pundits feel that really uh, changed the whole uh, complexion that he was around, and he wound up playing. Uh, he led the team. He was a great scorer in that particular series, and they wound up coming back and on a Paul Henderson goal that was set up I believe by Phil Esposito uh, wound up beating the Russians and I mean there was that type of those acts of you know being out there you know putting yourself out there really I think set him apart it's funny and there's another story about in that particular series when the Team Canada was in the hotel, in the Russian hotel. They thought that their rooms were going to be were being bugged. So I don't know if you heard this story. So Esposito had all of his teammates look underneath uh, the rugs in their respective um, rooms to see if they could find any bugging devices. Because they actually thought that their Alan Eagleson, who was in charge of uh, putting that team together, and Harry Sinden, thought that there was a chance that their uh, their rooms would be bugged by the Russian Federation. Uh, uh, and so they, they looked for bugging devices. And I guess with Esposito and a couple others found some sort of metal object underneath their carpet and they removed that metal object only to find that uh, they unscrewed the uh, the chandelier from the ballroom the whole chandelier fell <laughs> fell into a million pieces in the ballroom but yeah I mean that was those stories that um, that are being told uh, back then uh, yeah they resonate even today I mean it was just a different breed of athlete I guess back then huh oh well I mean we could we could do a whole <laughs> two hours of the 1972 summit series uh, you know it's still that yeah that uh Goal is still referred to as the goal hoarder around the world, you know, between that and 87 Canada Cup. And I guess maybe Crosby's goal in 2010 in the Olympics, that series is probably the biggest hockey yeah. for, hockey history for Canada around uh, at, with Foster Hewitt on the call. And last year was the 45th anniversary and CBC did a ton about it. But yeah, that Esposito speech is classic. I, I wish we had the rights for it that we could <laughs> we could play it. Right, we could play it right now. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe we could. It's not owned by the NHL. Maybe it's maybe it's open right now. But ah. yeah, uh, Esposito and Henderson Henderson were quite the duo on that team. Each scored seven goals um, during during that um, that eight game series in '72. Yep. Yeah, it was something else, and you'll get a kick out of this. There was no cable back then, and I remember having to watch it on Channel 13. I think it's WNET. I forget the. Uh, the, the call uh, letters for that channel but and we have to I think it was early in the morning I used to have to I would have to get up very very early in the morning to watch it but it was on channel 13 it wasn't on any of the sports stations and uh, yeah it was very very and the, the feed wasn't that great either it was somewhat grainy and uh, I guess the transmission from the, the Soviet Union back then or Russia back then wasn't the greatest and uh, yeah so that was very it was interesting it really really was it's uh, one of the greatest sports uh, series of all time yeah, it was something else, especially for Canada, obviously. But uh, all those players played well. Park had a good series. Rattel, uh, J.P. Parisi had a good series. Um, uh, Esposito, like you said, Paul Henderson, uh, they were all great. I don't think Bobby Orr played in that series. I think uh, he was unable to play, if memories. I don't think, no. Bob, Bobby Orr was not, he was injured. He was, he, he, and he did not, I don't believe, uh, he was on the roster, but he, you know, but yeah, he did he not play. play. And I think they had, um, I think Ken Dryden and Tony Esposito were the goalies. Although Tony Esposito didn't play much. I think it was basically they rode Dryden. I'm trying to think who the third goalie was, who they brought. But um, I think it was Tony O and Dryden. Dryden, they, I think, played most of, if not every single minute of that series um, to check up on that. But, yeah, it was a great series. It really, really was. But, uh, anyway, any uh, finishing um, thoughts on, on Esposito? Anything that uh, you want to add, Rob, before we, uh, we finish up? You know, the one thing, you know, as I was really thinking about Esposito and where he stands in the pantheon of hockey greats, how far do you think he is from the, you know, we talk about the top three or four of or, or Lemieux, Gretzky, and Howe. How far from that do you think Esposito is? Oh, boy. I think he's up there. You know, I mean, he was, when he left, when he retired, I think he was only second to Gordie Howe in points, if memory serves me correctly. Uh, he was the first to score uh, 70 goals in a season, right? I think um, he smashed 
Bobby Hull's record. I think Bobby Hull was the first one to score more than 50. I think Bobby Hull had scored 54 in one year. And Esposito was the first one to really destroy that. And destroy it, he did. I mean, he had several seasons of uh, over 60 goals, 70 goals. Um, he's got to be up there. I, you know, I think his style of play, you know, kept him from being, you know, considered today with the likes of Lemieux and Gretzky. But then again, I think there's a real bias today, like in anything in sports. I think it truly was the forgotten era of hockey back in the 60s and 70s, you know. Um, and because of that, I don't think there's as much of an appreciation for how skilled some of those players were relative to the time that they played. So my feeling is someone who's seen all of the um, all of the, uh, the different eras of hockey going back to the 60s, I think he's, he's got to be right up there with Lemieux, with Gretzky, with Bobby Orr, definitely. To me, Bobby Orr is the greatest player. I put him number one, Gretzky number two. But I think Esposito is definitely, definitely in the top ten, without a doubt. Top ten. And during his time, I think he was uh, one and two with, with Bobby Orr. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I've been going back and forth on this, and they, they you know, we're not going to get into this right now. <laughs> you sound like my son. You know, you know, it's important to know. You know, one of my favorite hockey stats is point shares, which is really a simple way to look at it is how how much a team, how much a player contributes to a team's overall points. You know, you know, Esposito is number five all time uh, in offensive point shares, only behind Gretzky, Howe, Yager, and Lemieux. Um, mm-hmm. And really, nobody else active right now. Espos- uh, Ovechkin's the only one that could even get close to that, and he's going to have to play a few more years at this level to get there. Uh, you know, we talk about forgotten greats, of, you know, legends of the Rangers. I don't want to say Esposito was forgotten, but in terms of his greatness, but he definitely gets overlooked compared to these other names. Absolutely. So, where would you put him? Knowing what you've learned from you know, your due diligence and what you've seen and what you've heard and compared to other players, where would you put him? You know, I don't know if I could ever compare defensemen and in, in forwards and centers. You know, that's you know, and that's difficult for me. You know, goalies as well. Yeah, that's true too. Um, you know, I don't know if I put him at at the level of a Lemieux. Um, you know, and the I you know thinking about Yarmir Yager and where he stands in all of that, but he's definitely right. He's definitely right behind that group. Well, he was a transcendent figure. He really transcended the game. He, and he changed the game the way he was played. I mean, I think he brought, you know, that whole Bruin team with size and skill, Cashman, Hodge, and Esposito, they were all big guys, but they could play. You know, they really brought, before that, if you had a big guy, although John Ferguson was some, somewhat like that. He was a good, big, tough winger with Canadians who could score, chip in 15, 20 goals a year. But I think Cashman, Hodge, and Esposito during that time brought it to another level. And I think that changed the way the game was played. As I mentioned, the Flyers started building their team like the Bruins, the Bruins model, the Islanders did. You know, Esposito, that quick shot, you know, loitering in the slot, you know, as, um, <laughs> it's funny, I forgot to mention a little bit of a line, you know, of Stan Fischler, you know, Esposito was called the, the great garbage collector, you know, and Fischler added to that line by saying he was the most well-paid garbage collector ever, you know, <laughs> the, way, the way he could score those goals. Uh, but, I mean, he was just deadly. He had that wrist shot. He was he was there for the rebounds. Bobby Orr, you know, would shoot from the point. And if he didn't score cleanly, you know, there would be those rebounds. And Esposito had the size and strength and skill and the lateral movement to be able to get to those rebounds to and bury those rebounds and and, and score goals. And um, I don't know if Lemieux, I don't know if he if Lemieux and Gretzky changed the game to where. See, I don't know if any other players could do what Lemieux and Gretzky did unless you had that type of skill. But Esposito, I think a lot of players could relate to what he. did did and they could they could pattern their game after the way Esposito played the game. So I think Esposito related more to the young hockey player back in the day that you know I could be like him. I don't know if most players could have had the skill level that a Lemieux and Gretzky had. I don't know. No, yeah, that absolutely and you know Esposito brought something different as a leader than I think Lemieux or Gretzky oh, yeah. brought to the team. You know, Esposito used to have an old rule. You at least have to come to the bar for the first beer. You don't have to stay for anything after that, but you have to be there for the first. Uh, you know, and yep. hockey is a much different world right now. Right now, it's just twenty, you know, twenty-five, twenty-six guys working together, and usually just going home. Esposito saw is a much different way, uh, a brotherhood, a team um, that we unfortunately don't see anymore. That's very true. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, the big number seventy-seven. You know, it's uh, he had some good years with the Rangers. You know, he led the team to the Stanley Cup Finals, uh, scored forty-two goals the year they went to the Stanley Cup Finals. He really uh, helped mold Don Murdoch and uh, Don Maloney into very good hockey players, especially Don Maloney, who uh, had a very, very good career in the National Hockey League. You know, he brought respectability back to the Rangers. 
when we went to the finals, you know, they had uh, that was only the second Stanley Cup final they had been to since 1940. You know, the the heartbreaking loss to the Bruins in '72 to Phil Esposito and the Big Bad Bruins. But yeah, the Rangers fell in some tough times there, losing to the Islanders in the playoffs. And then uh, you know, the Islanders were a team on the rise, but the Rangers were able to knock them off in 1979, courtesy of Phil Esposito and Freddie Shiro and Ron Gresher and and uh, some of the key players that that Phil Esposito led during that 1979 season. And then he retired, uh, you know, I guess it was the 81 season uh, in January. Uh, Buffalo Sabre game at Madison Square Garden was his very last game. I believe he scored, had a couple of assists in that game to end it, end his, end his career. But, uh, yeah, so, uh, Rob, I want to thank you. Any other last points you want to uh, bring up before we uh, end the show today? No, I got nothing else. But, you know, again, thanks for having me. I had a good time talking about Phil Esposito and the New York Rangers. Yeah, thank you, Rob. It's great having you. I can't wait for our next podcast. We'll have to think about who we're going to uh, uh, discuss next time and profile next time. So I want to thank everyone for tuning in today. Uh, it was a pleasure talking uh, about big number 77, Phil Esposito, one of the forgotten Rangers from the 1970s and early 1980s, one of the top 100 players in National Hockey League history. Rob, again, I want to thank you for uh, bringing a real positive energy to the show. I'm looking forward to working with you going forward. This ends the uh, 12th episode of the Forgotten Hockey Player of Broadway. Thanks again for tuning in. Thank you for listening. This has been a Go Tommy Boy production. 